Thank you, Tim. If you have your Bible, turn, your, turn to uh, Luke chapter 15. And I'm going to read a few verses here, a few more than what we read <clears throat> just a minute ago. Speaking of Bibles, Jenny, you don't have Rita's Bible with you this morning, do you? I thought you might. I just thought just a little bit. Rita Mosley's Bible was wore out. Wore out. Duct tape on the back trying to hold it together. Flip through it and just writing on every page. We know, we know that she read it through 16 times. Okay? And, uh, and, we, and we're just assuming there's probably more than that. But those are the ones we could figure out. I say we, I didn't. Uh, her daughter Jenny did. But uh, just a lot of, lot of writing in it and uh, note taking and, um, you know, it's just a, 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 a woman, a, a, you know, a lady, a lady after God's own heart. When you are that voracious a, a reader of the scriptures, then you're, you're seeking God. You're, there's no, there's no other, there's no other reason. You're seeking God, and you need God, and that's that was really uh, that really impressed me um, in learning of that and seeing that Bible. So, if you have your Bible, and I hope that you do, Luke 15, verse 11, and he said, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father. Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he delivered unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country. And there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in the land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. And he sent him into the fields to feed swine, and he would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe, and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand, and shoes on his feet, and bring hither the fatted calf, and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this is my son, or, or this, for this my son was dead, and is alive again. He was lost, and is found. And they began to be Mary, I love, I love this this parable here, uh, and this is the last sermon. We preached one every month this year on home building, okay, and, and just trying to, you know, tr trying to get information out there, trying to get the truth out there about um, about relationships in the home, and um, and 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 I know that a lot of our people here are, are senior age and, and so forth, but but you're still grandparents and some great grandparents, and there's still a role that you can play, and, and we've talked about that. This morning we won't be well. Here's what we're going to talk about: the parent. To the, this sermon is addressed to the parents of prodigals. Don't answer this question. It's it's rhetorical. But how many of you out there, how many of us out there have a have or have had a prodigal child, a child that just didn't go the way, you know, the life just didn't end up the way that we thought and we hoped and that we had dreamed that when that baby was born, you know, we held that child. I mean, come on, folks, as a parent, as a new as a new parent, you're looking and, and all you see, all you can imagine for that child is good. It's good. And, 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 and you in your dream and you already have been since the day you found out you were expecting and and uh, <laughs> and you're you began to dream and 
of, of, of the good life and, 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 and the training that hopefully you plan to instill in that child and to put them on that right road and, and, uh, and, and, and you know, get them in the church and keep them in the church and teach them the ways of God and the things of God. And, and you had enormous dreams for that child. And then, you know, maybe 18 or 20 years later, and sometimes even earlier than that, but at some point later in life, you, you saw that, well, you found yourself heartbroken, shattered. The dreams that you had for that child are gone. They, they, they took wings and they flew away a long time ago. As you see the child making decisions that you know are going to end in destruction, that you know are definitely not going to honor God and it's going to kill them, uh, 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 you know, the, the, their, their lives. And, and the hopes and dreams that you had for them are going to fall and be dashed on the shores, on the rocks of life as, as you see life come in. And, and, they're, they're, and you know, the child's often seen seemingly unaware, just as a prodigal here, unaware of the dangers that are out there. Yet they, they, the prodigal asked for that money, his inheritance from his father, and says, I'm out of here. I don't want to be out. I want to shake the dust of this little town off my feet. And I want to go see the world. And I want to experience the world. And, and I have a decent inheritance coming to me. And the father said, here, you can have it and go. And he went out and he wrecked his life Oh, he experienced the world, and it left him poor and destitute and without any future, without even the ability to feed himself. But he came to his senses, right? And he, now I'm just going to recount the story. He comes back and says, man, if I was a servant in my father's house, I'd eat better than what I'm eating today. I just need to go back. I need to go back and ask for forgiveness. And you don't need to treat me as a son anymore. Just treat me as a servant and I'll work for you. And you can feed me and I'll be happy with that. This morning, I'm not talking to the prodigals. I'm talking to the parents of a prodigal. Because I want you to see, I want to take note this morning of the attitude of how the father in this parable dealt with his grief, how he dealt with his brokenness. And there's no doubt that he experienced these things. We, we read through the scriptures often. We read through them and we just read, yeah, and, and, and uh, the, 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 you know, the, the son asked for his money and the father gave him his money and went out and he blew it in the world. And then he came back and all was good. No, no, no. Stop and meditate once in a while, folks, in the word of God. Just stop. And just think, okay, if I were the father, how would I have fit, felt if my son basically said, I wish you were dead, because if you were dead, I'd get my inheritance. So how about just giving it to me now? That's kind of what the son was saying. You don't really mean much to me, and, and, and I want right now what's coming to me. How would you feel as you saw your son leave the, leave the house? And some of, some of you have, have experienced this. And going down a path, it's going, to ruin, it's going to ruin them. You've seen it. You see it today. It's happening today. Put yourself in the Father's shoes. Those of you that can't, that haven't experienced this in life, put yourself in the Father's shoes and try to experience, well, what was he thinking? What could he have been thinking? What would I be thinking? Well, you know what? Whatever you were thinking, it's probably what he was thinking in a lot of ways. So we're going to take a look at how the father handled this. Point number one, the father stayed on the porch. The, the father stayed on the porch. Verse 20, and he arose and came to his father. So the prodigal finally came to his senses. Verse 17 says, and when he came to himself, in other words, ding, the light comes on, the light bulb comes on. What in the world have I done? All right. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion. I believe that we can take away from that right there that the father every day. I don't think this is a stretch. I believe that the father every day went out on his porch and just watched. And just scanned the countryside. 
Maybe several times a day wondering when the day was going to be that his son was going to be coming home. Because when the day that his son chose to came, come home, and however long to, to, it took him to get from wherever he was to back to his father's house, the father saw him a, way, a, a long way off and ran out to meet him. The father stayed on the porch, even as the father experienced the unbearable grief. And let me say this before going any further. This lesson can also is, is a lesson also that can help us in our grieving process regardless of the cause. Watching how the father handled his grief with his son can help us in our grieving situation, whether it's a, a, over a prodigal son or something else. So if you're out there, if you're saying, well, I'm not grieving over a prodigal, you know, start watching your watch. No, just back up. This is a very good, uh, a very good sermon for people in the grieving process, period. As he experienced the unbearable grief that seemingly permeates everything around him. Sometimes the grief is so strong in our life over a loss that it taints everything. It, it, it infects everything around us. There's no doubt that he dealt with that same emotion. But it didn't change him. It didn't change who he was. When we have reached our limits, feeling like we cannot take another day, we must remember that is it, it is during these times that we need God the most. And that God will be most real to us. During the, there are the times of our greatest need. Does that make sense? Okay, I see a couple of people looking at me like... Huh? Often we, we, we are, we are look, we're between that proverbial rock and a hard place and we don't know where to go. And what we do, we just shut down and we shut down from everybody and everything. And, and, and we just, and we, and we, and we, as the grief permeates our very soul and infects us uh, in, in, in every way, in every area, we shut down. And that is the last thing that we should do. The father kept, look, the father kept hope that there would be a better day. One day that he would see his son return to him. And we need to keep hope. Whatever loss that you've experienced that God says, I still have a plan for your life. Don't leave me now. Now is when you need me the most. Don't stop your Bible reading now. Now is when you need to read your Bible the most. Don't stop prayer now. Now is when you need prayer the most. Don't stop. Look, don't stop socializing with your church family. Don't stop going to church. Now is when you need church the most. But often we find ourselves pulling back. We just, everything just looks, we, 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 get, we get critical. We get, uh, we, we start to look at everything through that glass of grief and it just it's, it's, it becomes a very very hard thing to deal with 1 Peter 5 7 says casting all your care upon him for he careth for you we see this in the father in the parable he saw now look what would you been what would have been your reaction what would have been your my reaction yeah there he is. About time. Hey, about time. You have fun? You have fun out there? That's what we want to say, but it's what we can't say. The father, look, and he didn't even he didn't even just stand there. He saw him and he said, That's my son. That looks a lot like my son. Hey. Is, is that my son? Is that that's your brother? It looks like him. And what did he do? He ran out to meet him. That's the kind of spirit that we need to have. Sure, you're broken. I I, I know. I mean, we've all experienced. Some more than others, but we've all experienced some grief in this life. But we can't let it change who we are. We can't let it change. Uh, uh, we, we can't let it change us. 
We've got to stay by the things that we know. Uh, continue thou in the things, as Paul told Timothy, continue thou in the things thou hast learned. Stay after God. You loved your son back then. You still love him now. Don't give up hope. And whatever the grief is, you may say, well, I've lost a, I've lost a spouse. Well, they're not coming back. Doesn't matter. I can be on my porch all day long. They're not coming back. I know that. But God still has a plan for you. And do not let whatever the, the grieving situation, whatever the details, whatever the scenario is, do not let it change who you are. God wants to use us to make us stronger. And it is during these times that we need God the most. And it is during these times that God will change us the most. You may desire to hear an apology from the prodigal. You may want to hear the prodigal say how much he loves you and how, how sorry he is or she is. But you know, these things may never come. As selfishness is one of the most significant traits of a prodigal. Don't create the scenario in your mind. Look, you cannot control them. You can control you, though. Don't set up this, well, if this happens this way, and if they say this, and, and, and <coughs> if, they, if they come back <coughs> with this attitude, then, uh, then, you know, I'll think about it. No, you can't control them. But you can control you. We can control ourselves. And the father said, I love my boy. And I'm not going to let this grief shatter who I am. And I will love my boy when he returns also. A prodigal or grief, let's just say grief. Grief can challenge the way you think. It can cause you to rethink your convictions. It can cause you to rethink your, your principles. And uh, it can cause you to rethink how you raise a child. Look, folks, sometimes you raise a child uh, in the best way possible, and they just don't make the decisions that we want them to make, do they? They just don't. Don't, don't, don't commit that emotional suicide by rethinking and said, I should have did this and I did all that wrong and it's all my fault. No, I would guess in most cases, you probably did the very best you could and that's all God expects you to do. And they just made decisions. They, made, they just went on when they were able to make their own decisions, they just went another way. Don't let that change you though. Number two. A little bit of a carry, uh, you know, is moving on with number one. But the father stayed the same person. The father's reaction when he saw his come, uh, when he saw his uh, son coming home, was to run out. He loved him that day as much as he loved him before. As we said, uh, we're continuing the thought of grief and hurt did not change who he was. Often family trials completely change a person. Some, as I've already said here, I've gotten ahead of myself, but some become reclusive, full of self-pity, caring too much about, uh, you know, what other people think or not caring enough about what other people think. Don't let the trials of life turn you away from the resources you need for help. 2 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18 says, Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks. This is a great little outline uh, uh, to use as, as a foundation for living a life. All three of these help keep our hope in God. You cannot, look, we've got to understand that we cannot control people. But we can control how their actions affect us. And don't let that change you. Rejoice in what you do have. He still had a son at home. The father still had his farm and, and you know, whatever, he, whatever his business was. He still had all of that. 
be, let's be thankful for what we do have. Let's invest uh, in, 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 in not change in our relationship to what we still have. We often get caught thinking far too much about what we don't have instead of being thankful and rejoicing over for what we do have. Pray for what you have. Rejoice evermore. Pray, for, pray without ceasing. And then everything give thanks. Always be ready to forgive and restore relationships. I won't tell all the details. I've told it here before. There was a young man. I was the best man in his wedding. He worked for me uh, at the college when I worked up at, in Indiana at the college. And we were, clo we were as close as, a, as just, you know, two men could be uh, with that relationship. And then something happened. And uh, everything went south. And it was me. I'm the one that was south. I got really hard. And, and, uh, and, and I said some things that I regretted later and as i regretted them i said whatever they were true but just because it's true doesn't make it right to say we need to get that through our heads sometimes just because it's true doesn't make it right but i said it because that's who i was at that time in my life i was hard i was just i was just hard kind of a hard guy and it ruined, it broke, it fractured a relationship. Five years went by. And for five years, God tormented me. And said, you need to go back and you need to ask forgiveness from him. Because you mistreated him. And for a long time, I just justified it with the, well, I was right. If he can't deal with it, that's his problem. Not true. Five years later... I went to him before a service, Wednesday night service, up in a balcony at the church, great big old church. I went up to him and I stuck my hand out and I said, will you forgive me for what happened five years ago? I said, I was wrong. I didn't go to say, but you know I was right. I just maybe, I didn't even go there. I was wrong in how I treated you and I am just so sorry. And it's been bugging me and it's killing me and I want things to be the way that they used to be. And you know what? He shook, shook my hand and he said, I forgave you a long time ago. Be willing to forgive. Yeah, but you don't know. Uh, you don't know the grief they've caused me. Be willing to forgive. Unforgiveness is, um, as, as, as one person said, it's like drinking poison and expecting the other person to be affected by it. Look, it kills us. Bitterness and unforgiveness, it robs us. It's a cancer in us. And it changes who we are. So and so has never been the same since that thing happened to them. Remember? Remember how wonderful and happy and 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 and, and they, they <clears throat> when they walked into a room, they just they lit up the room with their personality and but you know, when that thing happened in their life, they're not the same person. It took something out of them. And I do understand. Sometimes it feels like our heart's being ripped out and, and we're being robbed of everything that we need to be happy. But we're not. That's emotion. And mourning and grieving, that is a process. But at some point, you've got to look at, we got to look at ourselves in the mirror say, and say, but by the grace of God, it's not going to change who I am. My value is in God, is in God. And this situation, though hard it is, this too will pass. And I need to rejoice and all things give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Dig deeper into the word of God. Spend more time in prayer. Draw closer to God. And say, I will not let this, uh, this is a process. I, this too shall come to pass. I will get through it. And it's not going to change who I am. Point number three, the father stayed after the same pursuits. Grief is a powerful source. Depression can often wound a person so profoundly that they give up on life. They become numb to the pursuits of life and they lose everything. Apparently, the father just stayed after it. Because when the son came home, he said, hey, go kill the fatted calf. Well, if he had just dropped life and just fell down and just refused to move another inch since his son left, everything else around him would have fell apart. But he kept his life together. 
So much so that bring a robe, bring a ring, go kill a big fat calf out there, and let's have a party. Let's celebrate that the son has come home. He stayed after it, in other words. Whatever his business was, look, if he was raising cattle, he just continued to raise cattle. If he was growing, if he, if, if he was growing a garden, he just could, continued gardening. Whatever he did, it's obvious from this that the father maintained his pursuits. And, and, and he did not allow this, uh, this grief to just totally rob him of, 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 of any more ambition for life. That's allowing life to run who you are. You can't control out there. I mean, you might think you can, and maybe we can just a little bit here and there. But by and large, life happens to everybody. And grief comes to everybody. And disappointment comes to everybody. And brokenness comes to everybody. It's how we deal with it. And we need to deal with it as we saw the Father deal with it. He never gave up hope. He stayed on the porch looking every day. He never allowed it to change him as a person. I assume, I just assume, he was a forgiving person before his son left. And when his son came back, he was still a forgiving person. He didn't allow it to change his values and his principles and his convictions. And he didn't allow it to change his, uh, to cause him, well, to just to quit. I'm, quit. I'm done. If this is what life's about, forget it. I'm done with this. I'm done. I'll just, look, you figure out what you want to do. I'll figure out what I'll, you do you, I'll do me, and, and whatever. Hey, what? And become bitter. He never went there. Apparently, he never went there. He maintained his focus on life and his responsibilities to provide for his family, to provide for his servants. He kept the family business going, whatever that was. And he refused to allow this gut-wrenching thing to change who he was and to change his pursuits and to cause him to quit. Martin Luther said, where the battle rages, there the loyalty of the soldier is proven. Where the battle rages, there the loyalty of the soldier is proven. When life gets hot and heavy and the battles and the bullets and the, and, and the, and the bombs are flying overhead and whistling by, that's when our, the time of our faith is actually being proven. It's not during the easy times. Everybody wakes up during the easy times, and that's easy. That's easy faith. It's during the hard times when our faith is tested. God knows our faith, but He'll reveal it to us during the hard times. And obviously, the Father's faith was solid, because we didn't see Him change here. A man named Max Licato made this statement. What is the difference between mercy and grace? Mercy gave the prodigal son a second chance. Grace gave him a feast. I like that. He didn't have to give him a feast. He could have just received him back mercifully. He said, come on back. I'll give you a job. We'll take care of you. Put a roof over your head again. But he gave him a feast. That's grace. Mercy is not given to someone what they deserve. And grace is giving them something they don't deserve. That was the Father, and that needs to be us. I don't know. Well, some of you I do know. I was going to say, I don't know what you're going through. I do know some of you, and I do know what you're going through. What we're trying to do today is trying to encourage you. What God's trying to say to you today is don't give up. Don't quit. This is a challenge to your faith. I understand that. Stay hopeful. Stay on the porch. Stay the same person. Don't let it change who you are. As a matter of fact, allow it to mold and make you into a stronger version of who you are. Allow it to mold and make you into the version, the best version that God believes you can be. That's what this is about. It's not about quitting. Stay right where you're at. Keep your nose to the grindstone. You're going to get through it. Don't give up on God. 
Don't let it change who you are. Unless the change is a greater faith and a more appreciation for God and for the things you already have. Unless those are the changes. Let's pray. If you're here this morning without Christ, I urge you, I urge you, I beg you, I whatever it will take to convince you to don't live another day without Christ. If you die without Christ, you truly will be without Christ for eternity. You may say, well, I think I'm saved. I mean, I, I, think, I think I'm born again. I think I'm going to heaven. That's not good enough. You need to know. God wants you to know. You may be sitting there saying, I know I'm not saved. Whichever the case, God offers you this morning the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You've got to believe in the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You've got to believe that He came to this earth to go to that cross and to die as, the, as a payment for our sin. And that He was buried. And that three days later He rose again. Showing that he had, con he, had, he had victory over death. And that same victory is given to you and me. Oh, not over the death of a physical body. It's going to die. It's, it's sentient. It's weak. It's going to give up. I'm talking about the death of the soul. I'm talking about the soul being eternally separated from God in what is not a death as we see it. But death really for the soul is just a matter of someplace else than where you're at now. And we want that someplace to be heaven. If you're without Christ, please don't wait another day. If you're here this morning and, and you're suffering, you're struggling. You just don't seem to be able to shake the grief. Remember these lessons today. That God taught us from this, from this uh, parable. Stay strong in His grace. Stay strong and firm in your conviction and your faith. Don't allow it to change you into a bitter, weak, reclusive person. Allow it actually to draw you closer to God. And to create in you the best version of you that God has dreamed. Let's not be prodigals ourselves. Maybe the grief has struck us in a way to where we, we want to be prodigals. We just want to run from God and run from everybody. But we don't let that happen. Let's not be a prodigal. Let's stay right where we're at. Practicing the, the same things. The truth has not changed. Just because the grief came to us doesn't mean the truth has changed because it hasn't. God, help us please now. Help us please to deal with this. If you would stand right where you're at as an invitation.